Good evening and welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This series is presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in partnership with UC Irvine Health. My name is Adrian Windsor and I am a board member of the foundation. We would like to thank our generous sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith. Mike and Polly initiated this program back around, I think 2013, they have supported it every year uh, and they do it with such enthusiasm and it means so much to us that we are able to share the expertise of the people at UCI with our community. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our foundation. We are a membership foundation. And I'm telling you this, so I hope you will join. Uh, during the last decade, we have contributed more than $7 million in support for the library for um, media, for audio, and for digital materials, for programs, for capital projects. And so it's very important that we sustain our membership and, and keep this going. So if you want to join, go to nbplf.foundation.org and sign up. I hope you will. So let me say too that this program will conclude tonight with Q&A. So we request that you hold all your questions until the end and use the Q&A box rather than the chat to put your questions in. And we will try to get to all of them. So please, please be attentive and ask. I'm so pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Claire Henchcliffe. Dr. Claire Henchcliffe is a board certified UCI health neurologist who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of movement disorders with more than 20 years of experience treating patients with Parkinson's disease and related conditions. She earned her medical degree at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University. She completed an internal medicine internship and neurology residence at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, followed by a movement disorders fellowship at the same medical center. Prior to becoming chair of the UCI School of Medicine's Department of Neurology, Dr. Henchcliffe served as Weill Cornell Medicine's vice chair for clinical neurology research and chief of neurodegenerative disorders and as the attending neurologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital, both in New York City. Dr. Henchcliffe's research is focused on developing new treatments for Parkinson's disease, including stem cell-based regenerative therapy and gene therapy. We are so pleased to have her with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Claire Henchcliffe. Thank you so much. And um, before I uh, share my screen, I would just like to say thanks so much um, to the Newport Beach uh, Public Library Foundation for running this series. I, I was looking in the archives and, and uh, there's some really, really great information there. And um, thanks to uh, Adrian Windsor um, for a splendid introduction and, and also a great shout out to Mike and, and Polly Smith because I think this is a, a wonderful series. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen and let's get to the, um, let's get to the slides and we will kick off. Here we go. All right, so I'm, I'm hoping that that is uh, working well. Um, I would like to share with you um, some information about work that I've been involved with for, for more than 10 years, but. I've been really been interested in this area um, since my, my training more than 20 years ago. And that's the idea of um, whether we can repair the brain and um, what is the promise of stem cells? I, I think this idea of um, transplanting cells into the brain to try to help the brain repair and recover after a neurological injury, that's not a new idea. It's It's been around for, for, for decades, probably close to a hundred years, but um, with the uh, limitations in cells that were present previously, and I'll, I'll dig a little bit into that in the talk, um, the results have been varied. 
but oh my goodness, over the past one to two decades, there have been such rapid strides in um, new stem cell technologies that uh, the field it has really circled around and is taking another look. So um, let me uh, jump into my first slide. So I am a Parkinson's neurologist. Um, I'm fascinated by the brain. I think the brain reigns supreme, but even I have to step back and uh, look at um, other organs and their importance and how they put the brain into context. And um, there have been many um, previous studies, and actually there are some successful therapies that do use a regenerative medicine approach. So for example, um, bone marrow transplants. Um, so let's think a little bit about the potential for regenerative medicine and, and why, why it's so significant and, and why it's so important. And um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of basic biology. Um, many organs in our body actually do harbor their own stem cells. I'm going to be talking a lot about stem cells. So just know that as you're sitting there, hopefully um, comfortably at home, um, you have stem cells in your own body. So we do have adult stem cells. Um, they're present in, for example, the skin or the bone marrow so that as your blood cells die, the bone marrow can replenish them. And as your skin cells um, age and, and, and dry and slough off, you uh, generate um, healthy new skin cells. So in, in healthy conditions, um, either you know these stem cells can produce new cells or even if there's injury, they can regenerate um, to some degree new tissue. And the picture on the right um, is uh, a nice uh, gory picture to uh, show you at, at around dinner time of Prometheus. And um, if you remember, Prometheus uh, did badly. Um, uh, he stole fire. Um, his punishment was to be immobilized on a mountainside. And every day, an eagle would come and, and chew out, peck out, eat part of his liver. Um, his liver would then regrow. And um, that sounds crazy, right? Sounds like something from a myth. But in fact, that actually happens. Livers do regenerate themselves. So, um, so good for these organs in the body. Not so good for the brain. When I was training, actually, the dogma was that there were no stem cells in the brain. And whatever you were born with, it died. Once it died, it was gone. There was no way of coming back. There was no way of regenerating. Um, we now know there are stem cells in the brain, but they're present in small numbers and they're not present throughout the brain. So for a lot of areas of the brain that might be injured. So for example, in various strokes or in Parkinson's disease, really there's not a great capability of the brain to regenerate itself. So the question is, could we take that, that principle of regeneration and kind of help it along artificially using medical manipulations in order to help repair an injured brain. And um, there's an awful lot, this is a terribly hot field right now, there's an awful lot going on. When we think about the brain, um, not only does it face the challenge in um, sickness that I just mentioned, which is that it really just can't regenerate itself, but it also faces uh, other challenges. It's such an incredibly complex organ. Um, there are multiple different cell types. They're um, really arranged in a very complex way. And so I just wanted to show you three windows on the brain. The one on the left is very odd, actually. Um, this is from an exhibit in a, a place called At Bristol from 2011. It was called All About Us and helping people understand a little bit more about our own bodies. And the story goes, this is actually an anonymous donor who donated their own brain to be displayed in this uh, art exhibit. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, if you want to look online, there, there are some really great pictures, but I show it here. Um, and I hope you can see the, the mouse right now. So I'm just gonna point around, you know, this is the frontal lobe right here, the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. And even here in this um, little bit dark picture, you can see there's this kind of globe-like structure. It's actually very foliated. It's very beautiful. This is the cerebellum. And as a movement disorder neurologist, I'm really interested in this part of the brain because it, it helps us to um, balance. It helps us to stay coordinated. So you can see the complexity on the surface of the brain. 
Um, and then it connects down to the spinal cord. So we've got here the, um, the brain stem connecting down to the cord here. This middle picture is probably something a little bit more like what you're used to looking at. This is a brain MRI. And again, I think you can see in the hemisphere this um, absolutely spectacularly complex picture of, um, you know, kind of fold, folded um, tissue that really maximizes the surface area of the brain. So around the surface, we've, we've got cortex, which takes care of a lot of these higher order things that we need to deal with. And then deeper down in the brain, we have other structures. And I'm going to come back to these because some of these are really intimately involved with um, coordination again. And here's, here's our cerebellum, which is what I said, this helps you with balance and it helps with coordination. Um, but a, an area that I'm really interested in, very relevant to Parkinson's disease, is this kind of middle ground right here called the brainstem. And it, it's sort of the bridge, if you like, between the um, hemispheres up here, and then it bridges down to the spinal cord. So there's an awful lot going on here. And then um, the right hand pattern. So the, the, the middle is um, absolutely a beautiful picture. It shows you the structure. This is brain MRI. But now we can image in so much more sophisticated ways. And the panel on the right just reminds me to say that not only do we have an awfully complicated structure, but it's so integrated. The structures are so incredibly interconnected. And um, I think that's really important as we're thinking about regenerative medicine, because let's say we had a small lesion uh, right here in the cerebellum. Well, if we could repair that, we would want not only to repair the surrounding area, but we would want it to repair all of the interconnections that are so important to its function. So this is no mean feat, um, but I think, you know, the, there, there, there have been some recent steps that have made it incredibly exciting. Um, when we're talking about repairing the brain, I'm, I'm really gonna focus on what I'm most interested in, which is the cell replacement therapy, this, this last bullet point down here. But I wanted to point out that there are so many different groups looking at um, research in this area right now, um, and they're using very, very different approaches. So I, I, I do want to highlight that. When we're thinking about a brain where tissue has been damaged, cells have been damaged, we can think about using regenerative factors as opposed to loading up with new cells. Um, one regenerative factor I just noted here, it's called GDNF or glial derived neurotrophic factor. And anything with the words neurotrophic factor in its name um, is, is usually a good, a good thing for brain tissue, um, helps to regenerate. And so I'll never forget when I was training um, this would have been back around 2002 or 2003, I think. Um, there was a group in, in Bristol in England uh, run by Steve Gill, and he actually decided to do an experiment where they infused this GDNF actually directly into people's brain tissue to see if it could help with Parkinson's disease. He came over to present his, his results to my mentor in New York, and we were one of the first groups to um, see these, and they were really incredibly encouraging. Um, it takes a long time to develop these types of therapies. That was years ago. We still have clinical trials ongoing looking at GDNF. Um, one such clinical trial is actually a clinical trial of gene therapy, where you can take the GDNF gene and you can deliver it in viral vectors. And the viral vectors, are, they're sort of like a Trojan horse. It helps you to inject a therapeutic into the brain. It'll get it in there, get it into the cells, and then the DNA does the work. So you can kind of fool the cells or reprogram the cells into making their own regenerative factors. You can also use cell therapy in a somewhat similar way to um, use the cells as delivery vehicles. So again, you could think about delivering regenerative factors or maybe anti-inflammatory factors, all sorts of things um, uh, surgically into the brain. But again, what I'm most interested in is this idea that we could very precisely and surgically introduce cells into the brain to rebuild networks that have been damaged by disease. There have been many types of attempts to um, achieve this before. And in the past, um, I can name a few. In Huntington's disease, um, researchers tried using cells that came out of human embryos. In Parkinson's disease, researchers tried using cells 
that they actually harvested from people's own bodies. They harvested from their adrenal glands in one case or from um, the carotid body, which is a little um, a glob of tissue in the carotid artery sitting up in the neck in another case. Or in yet another example, they used um, cells that were harvested from the retina. And there was a great, there, there was a good rationale behind using all of these cells. You know, in some cases, um, they were thought to produce either dopamine or levodopa, which is kind of precursor to dopamine. So there was a good rationale. But in the end, there were so many problems. With some of the cell types, it turned out that probably the way they were thought to act wasn't really the way they were acting. And they might have been actually helpful by delivering these regenerative factors. So they were, it, that, that's great if they do that, but it was just never really that well understood. In others, for example, the retinal cells, it seemed like the cells just didn't. Once they were transplanted, they didn't survive so well. And then using cells that come from human embryos obviously has a lot of problems um, associated, including that scientifically, from embryo to embryo, these cells really differ. And so it really hampered um, attempts to uh, achieve any type of therapy using these. There was enough, though, um, that it was encouraging. You could see the cells could be delivered. The cells, in some cases, could survive. And in some cases, the patients actually did better. So the idea just, although it went on hold, the idea really never went away. And I think with the advances in stem cell therapies recently, um, these ideas have really just come rushing back. And um, I just put these two nice photographs in on the right. Um, we use a lot of robotic surgery at UC Irvine and Frank Sue and Michelle Paff and Michael O are the surgeons that I work with there in uh, Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. And Jefferson Chen was really instrumental in um, looking at, uh, he investigated using stem cells in traumatic brain injury and stroke a few years ago. And um, this is a surgeon in, in um, New York, Mike Caplet. And this, um, I'll loop back to what he did, but um, he was really the first person uh, to pioneer gene therapy in a number of neurological conditions. And I remember when I first went to work with him, seeing kids with Batten's disease that he had operated on, for example, or adults with Parkinson's disease. So really, there are multiple teams across the US and throughout the world who are very dedicated to trying to advance these types of therapies. Um, so I brought up advances in stem cells. Um, let's dig down because this is where it gets really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to start off with uh, stem cells 101, if you like, not to be facetious, but for anyone who's really interested in finding out more about stem cells, the um, International Society for stem cell research has fantastic resources on its website. And um, this really nice picture that you see on the slide, I actually found on the uh, Mayo Foundation website. So there's a lot of really good, really reliable information about stem cells. So these, the, the stem cells in this picture, they're kind of boring looking, right? They're just these sort of blobby brown cells um, and they're undifferentiated. They, they, they kind of don't particularly have a function. It's like they don't beat like muscle cells. They don't secrete hormones. They, they don't do any of that stuff that our adult cells do, but they have a couple of really important defining features. And basically without stem cells, none of us would be here. They can, so stem cells can make more stem cells. They can self-renew, they can divide. So if you've got stem cells in the laboratory, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes, you can essentially grow them in almost unlimited quantities, which means that you, you can really explore the ability to manipulate them for use in therapeutics, in, in, in developing new treatments. So that's the first thing about stem cells. The second thing is not only can they make more of the, their sort of brown blobby stem cell forms, they can also develop into more specialized cells. In fact, in um, our own human bodies, we probably have around more than 200 different types of cells and all of them come from stem cells. So, you know, we all develop from embryos and um, let's say a human embryo between three to five days, it's got about 150 stem cells sitting there and they know what to do. They make cells that will differentiate through various stages into all of the cells that we need. So the cardiac cells, that is the heart muscle cells, the nerve cells that you see on the right, the blood cells, including white blood cells or red blood cells, 
liver cells, I mean, brain cells, everything. So when I say that without stem cells, we wouldn't be here, I, I, I truly mean it. And, um, you know, they're kind of the body's master cells. So what I've been talking about so far are these very, um, these naturally occurring types of stem cells. And there are two types you have picked up on already. So the embryonic stem cells. So when we're embryos, we're stem cells and we're gonna develop from those. And then the adult stem cells. So I mentioned that um, we have, for example, stem cells in the bone marrow that can, in the adult, renew red blood cells or other blood cells. We have stem cells sitting in the skin so they can renew um, skin cells. So these adult stem cells, just a, a couple of points, you know, they're spread through many organs in the body. There are not that many of them, and they're kind of more limited than the embryonic stem cells. So whereas an embryonic stem cell is truly what we call totipotent and can make any single type of cell that you need in your body, the adult stem cells are not. They're much more limited. They could just make a few different um, stem cells. So if you've got a stem cell sitting in your bone marrow, it's not going to make a brain cell, for example, um, and so on and so forth. Um, however, here's one of the kind of revolutionary pieces of science that I wanted to bring up for you. Um, not only are there naturally occurring stem cells, we can actually manipulate them in the lab. And um, the two guys you see here, John Gordon on the left, I knew him when I was training in Cambridge, and um, Shinya Yamanaka, who had the, I had the immense pleasure of meeting in Kyoto, they actually got the Nobel Prize. I think that was back in 2007. And um, I have to say, I love, the, I love the headline in this one, Nobel Prize won by Britain, written off in his teens by a science teacher that ran in The Guardian. And uh, so, you know, crazy ideas are, are not always crazy. But um, what these guys figured out how to do was, was really incredible. So let me tell you a little bit about laboratory grown cells and the embryonic cells, um, embryonic stem cells that can be grown in the laboratory versus what you may have read about, you may have seen in the, in the news, in the newspapers, um, these cells called iPS cells. So what's the difference? And they do have some similarities. So the embryonic stem cells, and my, my group in New York actually worked with these. This was my, um, one of my first experiences with stem cells. These cells actually derive from embryos aged about three to five days old. And those cells can be taken and they can be grown in pretty well unlimited quantities in the lab. You can then manipulate them. And I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. But these induced pluripotent cells, um, it's not surprising that these guys got the Nobel Prize. Basically, these are cells, they come from the adult. They are not adult stem cells, though. They're not the ones I was talking about. They actually come from our regular, mature, grown up, what we call fully differentiated cells. So it could come from your own skin cells, or it could come from your own blood cells, for example. And what they discovered how to do is um, take these cells into the laboratory, grow the cells, and then coax them using a series of um, kind of genetic programming technologies to become what look like, to all intents and purposes, embryonic stem cells. And these cells really seem to take on the qualities of bona fide, you know, authentic embryonic stem cells, but they haven't come from an embryo, they've come from an adult. So that makes them really interesting in several different regards. One is that now we can grow stem cells from pretty well any person. So each person has an individual genetic makeup, right? That means we can grow any individual's own cells with their own genetic makeup. That means if they have a particular disorder, whether it's neurological disorder or something else, we can actually take those cells and we can study them in the laboratory. And it's kind of a, a substitute for studying the person, but you can do a lot of things with cells in a, in a dish that you couldn't do with a person, right? So this is the, that concept of um, generating a disease in a dish that you've probably heard about. The second thing that we can do is we can take individual stem cells or, or individual skin cells or blood cells, we can coax them to become stem cells in the laboratory. We can then grow those cells and then we can do something really special with them, which is take those iPS cells and coax them to become different types of adult cells. We can do that with human embryonic stem cells, and now we can do it with iPS cells. So as an individual, for any of you, we could take your 
your skin cells, we could create your own um, personal iPS stem cells, and then we could make them back into skin cells. Don't know what would be the point of that. We could make them into blood cells. We could make them into heart muscle tissue. We could make them into brain cells. We could make them into dopamine producing nerve cells. Um, so you see where I'm going. This is where it gets really interesting in terms of thinking about developing new therapies. So before I go on any further, um, I just want to summarize how I think this new stem cell technology can help. So the ability to grow stem cells in the laboratory means that they're readily available. You're, you're, not, you're not limited by the availability of, let's say, retinal tissue or the patient's own adrenal gland tissue or the patient's own carotid body tissue. The cells are there, you can grow them, you can have them when you need them, um, and you can have as many as you want. So if you want to do what we call a dose ranging study and try to see, well, if, if transplanting a few cells is good, is transplanting a hundred times more, a hundred times better, you can do that. So it really frees you up in terms of what you can do for the studies. You can also develop technology, um, and this is, this is tricky, this is really hard, but it can be done. You can freeze these cells, you can cryopreserve them. Um, it means you can create really large cell banks um, that are very uniform, you know, in different aliquots or different vials, different test tubes. And essentially each test tube of cells is gonna be similar, right? So you could take, let's say a hundred of those test tubes and you could do all the quality control that you wanna do. And you can figure out what are those cells going to make? Are they making enough of my neurotransmitter that I want to see? Um, if I transplant them into animals, can I be sure that they don't make tumors, that they don't make rogue cells, that they don't spread to places that I don't want them in? So it makes the testing for safety and efficiency just a heck of a lot easier before you even start to think about transplanting them into people. And then the last piece of this is that, of course, if you're transplanting someone's own cells, those are 100% matched immunologically, right? No risk of rejection, no risk of bad reaction. In fact, it's complicated. The brain is somewhat immunoprivileged as a site, so it won't really do an outright rejection of cells that are not matched. But we do think that if the cells are not matched, then they don't survive and function quite as well as if they were matched. Um, so giving people back their own cells is really compelling. It's, it, it's something that um, I think we're all very excited about. But you can, if, if you think someone shouldn't get their own cells for some reason, um, let's say there's a genetic problem that means that they shouldn't get their own cells back because their own cells will have that same genetic problem. You could actually arrange for them to get cells from an immunologically matched donor. So that's actually what's being done in one of the studies that I'll mention in just a few minutes. Um, this, these types of approaches are being tried in Lou Gehrig's disease, um, stroke, traumatic brain injury, Huntington's disease. And in fact, Leslie Thompson, who's, who's given a talk in this series previously, she's doing some really amazing research that we're all hoping is going to contribute to a new therapy um, based on stem cell technology for Huntington's disease. But my area and where I'm going to focus a little bit more is in Parkinson's disease. And um, for those of you, Parkinson's disease is incredibly common. There are about 10 million people worldwide who have it and at least one and a half million in the States. It's very much associated with our aging process. So the older you get, the more likely you are to get it. And, you know, as we're a population who is aging and, and particularly in the OC, right, um, we're seeing more and more Parkinson's. And Parkinson's, when it's first diagnosed, can be treated very nicely, uh, for the most part, with um, medications. But as time goes on, it gets more tricky. Sometimes people end up going for deep brain stimulation surgery, and we do quite a bit of that at UC Irvine. Um, but we'd really like to find a way to address the underlying problem in Parkinson's. And one of the underlying problems in Parkinson's is that um, the symptoms that people get where they slow, they really just slow down. And, 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 and you know, people have said they feel like they're moving through mud or, or, or moving through molasses. Um, they get, people get incoordinated. It just gets hard to do things that you wouldn't even normally think about, you know, like twirl spaghetti with a fork or cut up your cut up a piece of chicken with a knife and fork. These things start to get really slow and, and, and frustrating. Um, so 
those symptoms are largely due to loss of dopamine in the brain. You probably heard about that. Um, the dopamine producing cells that are affected come from a, a tiny little part of the brain in the brainstem called the substantia nigra, but that's not really where the action is. The action in Parkinson's is, is not where the dopamine is produced, it's actually where it gets delivered. And it gets delivered a little ways away from the substantia nigra. And this is a PET scan of someone's brain. This is lovely PET scan of um, someone who's healthy, doesn't have Parkinson's. And um, what we're looking at is the um, kind of greenish, bluish coloration. That's the brain as a whole. It's fuzzy. It's not as nice to look at as an MRI, I know, but uh, bear with me. And then the red is actually where the dopamine is getting delivered. And you can see it sort of looks like a tadpole, right? It's really like a big fat tadpole. Um, and the head of the tadpole, uh, we call the chordate and the tail of the tadpole, we call the putamen. Those names don't matter so much until you're involved in doing the surgery on them and they matter a lot. And then on the right, we've got someone with um, Parkinson's. This is actually the husband of the uh, woman who is the healthy control on the left. And at this point, when we scanned him, he'd had Parkinson's for eight years. He was doing quite well, but you can just see that, you know, a lot of that red signal, it's just missing, right? The tail of the tadpole it's kind of gone. And um, because of that, because he wasn't getting the dopamine cells um, that light up red because they, they've really died, um, he's not getting enough dopamine in those areas. And that was causing him to slow down and be incoordinated. And again, the medications helped at the beginning, but it just gets trickier and trickier over time. And um, one of the ideas in the field has been to say, instead of giving medications that are essentially either replenishing dopamine or giving a sort of fake version of dopamine to these cells and fooling them into thinking that they're seeing dopamine. Why, why could we not transplant cells back? Why could we not rebuild what's going on here? Why couldn't we rebuild this tadpole with no tail to look like this tadpole um, with a lot, of, a lot of tail that has uh, dopamine producing cells that are essentially helping people to move? Um, and that's the rationale for the vast majority of clinical trials that have been undertaken in Parkinson's in the stem cell field in recent years. And I think I mentioned before, you know, the limitation previously has always been in the sorts of cells that were used. And so people have tried with human fetal cells, with the um, retinal cells, with um, adrenal cells, and the list goes on. And um, some of the results were good. Some of them were not so good. It was really hard to predict just a lot of variability there that we've all agonized over. Mm. So this is really where we think stem cells may come into their own. So um, the regenerative therapy for Parkinson's disease, it has been a long timeline, but there's been a lot of progress and particularly in the last few years. So just to kind of summarize where we got up to and then give you a little taster for the next five minutes of the talk. Um, it was known that we could grow human embryonic stem cells in the lab way back in the late 1990s. Um, people figured out that you could generate these dopamine producing nerve cells that we would want to use in Parkinson's for transplant. They figured that out in 2004. Unfortunately, those first cells, they were great in the dish. Um, it's just when you transplanted them, they didn't do so well and they didn't survive well. Um, I mentioned John Gordon and um, Shinya Yamanaka with the Nobel Prize and that was 2007 for the discovery of these human induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are the cells, if you remember, that you could grow these stem cells out of your skin biopsy or out of your blood, and then um, you can turn them into different sorts of cells. So by 2011, remember I said way back in 2004, we knew how to make do dopamine nerve cells from stem cells, but they just didn't do well after transplanting. Um, so scientist who's really brilliant, uh, Lorenz Studer in New York, um, uh, he figured out in 2011, by following a protocol in the lab, in a tissue culture dish, that was much more similar to how these cells develop in the developing human embryo, he managed to generate dopamine nerve cells that would survive just great in animal models of Parkinson's, and they would function he, he showed you could graft them, they would survive, they would function. And for animal models of Parkinson's, they would help with the Parkinson's symptoms that these animals had. Um, he went on to do some really great studies using a 
technology called optogenetics that helps you to switch the cells on and off. You can turn on and off the dopamine um, production. And he showed that it was actually the dopamine that was making the difference in these animal models. So this is where um, things got really exciting. 2017, I'm gonna show you uh, just a, um, a, a tiny, tiny little snippet of information about the first patient who got grafted with his own cells in New York. Um, I'll never forget being in the OR when that happened. Um, by 2018, the team in Kyoto, uh, associated with Dr. Yamanaka's group, so this was Dr. Jun Takahashi, grafted their first patient, not with their own cells, but with matched cells. And these have been developed again. They, these were iPS-based cells that have been developed from human adult tissue. And we just recently started to participate um, along with my old group in New York in um, a graft-based clinical trial looking at dopamine-producing cells that have been developed in the lab from human embryonic stem cell lines. And in this case, uh, the line was one of the original George Bush approved stem cell lines, believe it or not. So let me just tell you, uh, we'll just scratch the surface. Um, I called it the New York Boston Clinical Trial. Um, this is dark. And on Saturday night, uh, the Newport Beach Film Festival showed uh, a, a, a movie, um, it's just amazing about his fight with Parkinson's disease and the unusual steps that he took to combat Parkinson's disease using stem cell technology. So this is Dr. Um, George Lopez, who's a local. He got very interested in um, stem cell technologies and one group in particular intrigued him. It was Dr. Kwang Soo Kim's group who are at Harvard and they, they do really amazing work. They had figured out not only how to take cells from the human adult, any patient or anyone basically, create stem cells out of those and then turn them, coax them in the laboratory into dopamine producing cells. And with Doc, um, he, was their, he was their first uh, kind of test animal, I suppose. Um, well, they'd been tested in, in mice, but never, never in primates. And um, so in 2017, um, the team from Boston actually flew the cells down to New York, where we performed this, the first of two surgeries on Doc and transplanted, Dr. Mike Kaplett, um, the surgeon I worked with, transplanted cells into one side of his brain where his own dopamine cells were missing. Basically, they were failing to, to deliver dopamine, resulting in his Parkinson's symptoms. And sometime after that, he went for the second surgery, and that's what this documentary is about. Um, and, and again, a lot of excitement around that surgery where they transplanted cells into the other side of his brain. So this had been done in two stages because it was felt at the time it was probably safer. So um, I urge you, there's a lot of information about this on the internet. Um, Doc's cells, some of the cells seem to have survived. He certainly did better after the surgery. And, you know, I, I don't want to say too much about what that means because it's a single person. There's no control in this. Um, and so you can always argue that there is some placebo in there, but uh, you could see that the, the cells survived. And I, I think it was the first of multiple really important steps in the field. And he was, a, he was just a, a pioneer. Um, the second trial that I mentioned is in Kyoto, and this is Dr. Takahashi's group, who, who are just amazing. Um, so they, at, at the institute is called CIRA. They make these uh, clinical grade IPS cell stocks. So these are the induced pluripotent cells that are made from um, patients. They're actually from healthy patients, not people with Parkinson's. And then they turn them into the stem cells. They turn them into the dopamine producing nerve cells. And um, they, they, they can be matched or not matched, the choice is uh, the investigator's choice, um, and they can be transplanted into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. And so again, this is another group taking the initial steps to look at how these cells work, what their effects are, and are they safe? And do they cause side effects? Because 
these these cells, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, these cells may work great, but if they cause too many side effects, we're going nowhere with them as a treatment. And then um, this is a busy slide, so I, I don't need you to read it, but this is our current trial. So we're um, participating in this trial, clinical trial for people with more advanced Parkinson's where the medicines are not working as well as they used to. And the sites are UC Irvine, um, New York, Toronto, and it's what you call a phase one study, which is really, you know, the first time it's been done in humans, basically. And we're working with people with Parkinson's and we want to make sure that it looks safe. We want to make sure that it doesn't cause too many side effects. And then of course, we'd be crazy if we were not thinking about, well, you know, how, what, are, what are the effects and how well does this work? Um, so we enrolled our first patient in July. The first patient was actually operated in May. Um, our, our patient was operated in July and uh, that is going on. Um, and uh, I, Dr. Stefan Siria is, has just been immensely helpful. So I know the neurology, we have a neurosurgeon who is just fantastic, but these cells are not matched. And so when we're injecting, you know, almost 1 million on, on each side, or in a second um, set of patients, we're gonna be injecting almost 3 million cells per side. These are not matched. And so we thought it was most prudent to give some immunosuppression for a year. And Dr. Sioria is a fantastic transplant immunologist um, who, and, and without him, I, I, uh, I basically couldn't do that. So uh, these are also, this is a little bit of a shout out to our um, research coordinators. If anyone's interested, please grab a screenshot and um, they'd be really happy to answer your questions. So that's all I wanted to say about the work that we've been doing, um, but the road ahead is, is really exciting. I think the stem cells, um, the ability to grow these cells in the lab now and manipulate them really, has a very high likelihood of overcoming some of the previous limitations um, that have really hampered transplant studies in the past where we've been trying to regenerate and repair injuries to the brain. Um, but I don't want to leave you with, with the idea that this is all rosy and it's a cakewalk. Um, these cell therapies, they've got to be accessible. You know, right now it, it's so tricky to be able to perform the surgeries that a lot of places simply wouldn't be able to do it. They've got to be competitive. They can't be so expensive that people can't get them. Um, and I'll be completely honest, developing these cells is so laborious. It took us years and years and years in New York for our cells. Um, I think we can go a long way with improving surgical delivery. And right now, as things stand, a lot of the cells that get transplanted actually just die. You know, they, they, they don't survive. Um, so we we know how many die and we compensate for that. But if we could help them survive better, wouldn't that be better? And um, there's a lot of controversy about how immunologically matched the donor and the recipient need to be. How much does it matter? There are still people in the field um, who were, you know, in the field right at, from the get-go, right from the beginning, who'll say, it doesn't matter. You can put in these cells and they won't be matched and they're going to survive and they'll do fine. But what we're starting to think now is, well, they, they can survive, but they don't do as fine as they would if they were matched or if we use immunosuppression. And then finally, I just want to put an idea into people's heads. Um, no pun intended. Instead of transplanting, could we actually use people's own cells that are sitting in their own brains in place and directly reprogram them for repair. So just an idea. People are starting to think about all sorts of novel technologies, and that's one. So um, you can see this is uh, not just my work. This is a huge, huge team. Um, I have been the clinical person involved all the way along. And uh, you know this takes surgeons and transplant immunologists and more neurologists and neuropsychologists and psychiatrists and bioethicists, and the list goes on and on and on. Our studies funded by um, Blue Rock. We run it through our um, UC Irvine Stem Cell Research Center, which has an alpha stem cell clinic funded by CIRM, which is absolutely great. And then for any of you who are interested in finding out more about Parkinson's, um, we do have a 2021 Parkinson's Symposium coming up. Um, last year was the first one that I got to from UC Irvine. It was really fantastic. It's run by Nick Philippe, who's uh, just a, a wonderful, Parkinson's doc and Parkinson's researcher. And um, he will be putting on this symposium 
Uh, Saturday, November 20th, it runs in the morning. Um, there's a website uh, to register. Again, grab a screenshot if you can, but uh, if you just Google it, you'll, you'll find it just fine. Um, I'm gonna stop right there and thanks for your attention. I, um, I hope that I gave you some good information and I look forward to your questions. And let me stop the share. All right, thank you, Dr. Hinchcliffe. That was absolutely wonderful. You know, you're, you're right at the threshold, aren't we, of amazing discoveries. I mean, the story you've told us. I, 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 I truly hope we are. And, um, you know, every time that I, I meet a patient with Parkinson's who's either been for one of these older types of transplants, or is going from for one of the new ones. Um, it, it's it's inspiring. Um, you know, we, you, you think we we have a long way to go, but my goodness, we're moving really fast. That's it's fantastic. But we have a question here. What was the source of the stem cells implanted in your first patient? Were they his cells or from another source? Uh, must be very expensive to harvest and then differentiate the individual's own cells. Um, that is a fantastic question. Thank you. The first person that I talked about where we um, operated in New York, and this was 2017, um, that was Doc, Dr. George Lopez. Those were his own cells. Um, I honestly don't know how many millions of dollars went into developing the technology for that. Um, I think what we what we have to say is, you know, if if it's let's say $10 million or $15 million, it's not feasible, right? That's just not the right way to go, um, treating each individual like that. But the idea has always been that once we've pioneered the technology, it should be possible then to very efficiently apply the same technology to other people's cells. And so the idea is that it should get um, cheaper and cheaper. So that's the caveat for using people's own cells. Um, what the Japanese team have tried to do, which I think is really interesting, is to set up um, what they call a, a bank of, of cells that can be donated from super donors. And these super donors, the, the state of their immune system is that they can be really great donors for a whole bunch of different people. And so that you can imagine how that would bring the, the cost down to use super donors. And then um, the types of cells the first patient that I, I spoke about um, recently in 2021 and the second patient who went for surgery again in New York City, but using cells that came from the human embryonic stem cells. Um, I will just say when I when I started working with Lorenz Studer on those cells, he got um, he received a grant of 14 and a half million dollars from um, New York stem, uh, nice stem to help him take his discovery of how to make those cells and then turn it into something that actually would be ready for transplant that could be approved by the FDA. So it's millions and millions and millions of dollars. And the hope is that we can make this much more efficient. We can set up efficient banks of cells and make it accessible. Well, that's so what can you tell us what it would cost or to have right now a surgical implant? of these cells? Oh goodness, uh, zero. Um, so <laughs> this is where I get on my, this is where I get on my hobby horse. Um, you shouldn't be paying for research. Uh, these are all clinical trials. None of these um, interventions are approved by the FDA. They're approved, that's, well, that's, um, let me explain. They're approved by the FDA for use in experimental clinical trials. They're not approved for use for regular therapy. When people go for um, a clinical trial, basically you shouldn't expect to be paying for that. Um, and so for example, the clinical trial we're involved in um, with Blue Rock Therapeutics, uh, Blue Rock not only have paid for developing um, and storing the cells, they pay for the surgery, they pay for the immunosuppression, they pay for all of the visits that it takes with me because I'm watching these patients like a hawk and so are all the other doctors and they pay for the patients to um, travel in. Um, so that's, that's what you should really expect that from um, a, a, a good, robust, um, well-run clinical trial. So how do you get approved to be a participant in a clinical trial? Um, 
First of all, I, I think the first thing is to know that uh, there are clinical trials out there. The second thing is how do you, how do you find out about them? Um, there's a website and I, I wish I had put it up. It's uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but basically, if you, um, if you go to a lot of the websites about Parkinson's or, or any other disease process, um, you can find a lot of information about these clinical trials. So for example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has a site called, um, it's called Trial Finder. And it's almost like a matchmaker, you know, you, you, put, your, you put your information in, um, you say what you're looking for, and it can help you find the right trial. It can also help research um, coordinators find you if you, if you let them do that. Um, so once you've found something that you're interested in, um, it's a short step from there to contact the team. Um, it's very easy to find either a phone number or an email for the coordinators. That's the first step. They can tell you about the study. Um, they can tell you what's required for the study. I think not everyone wants to do every study. Um, certainly there are people who are interested in stem cells, but they may think twice if they're going to get a year of immunosuppressive drugs or, or it might not be good for them. And then um, there are what are called the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the studies, which are really built in um, guardrails, if you like, to, to try to keep things as safe as possible. So, for example, in our study, um, we wouldn't take someone who's got an active infection or who has an active cancer because giving someone immunosuppressants who's got a, an active cancer or an active inf infection, it would, be, it would be a crazy thing for us to do. Or um, what about taking someone whose Parkinson's is much more advanced to the point where we don't think that they stand to gain any advantage from going into the trial. So that would be unethical. So we wouldn't take someone who's, who's really had Parkinson's for so long that this couldn't possibly work for them. So there, there are a lot of um, caveats and um, it, it can be frustrating because I, I think when you've got your heart set on a particular type of approach, it's very frustrating then to hear that, oh, you know, you're 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 not uh, you're not old enough, or you're not young enough, or you haven't had Parkinson's for long enough, or you've had Parkinson's for too long. But we do try to do those things to um, keep people safe. We we have a question here about specific implication or trials for Alzheimer's. Are they doing similar things with Alzheimer's right now that you are doing with Parkinson's? Yeah. Um. I am really fascinated by Alzheimer's. Um, the reason, one reason why Parkinson's is a little easier is because when you lose the dopamine cells, it's in, a, it's in a pretty small area of the brain. So really you've got your target right there. You know, you know where you're going to um, inject surgically. Alzheimer's, oh my goodness, it's so much tougher. Um, the effects of Alzheimer's are much broader across much larger areas of the brain. So what I was talking about, which is injecting cells into one small little area, that's probably not the way to go with Alzheimer's. But then the question is, could you take a broader approach? Um, and that's where, you know, remember right at the beginning of my talk, I, I, I brought up some other ways of um, potentially using regenerative approaches in the brain. That's where you could start to think about cells delivering particular factors or, or gene therapies delivering particular factors. And um, there's, there's a big interest in um, gene therapy for Alzheimer's disease right now. And you probably know that there is a genetic component to Alzheimer's and people have thought, well, you know, that's, it's terrible for the people who, who are suffering from that, but can we turn it around and use that as a way to understand how to repair some of the damage that's been done? Thank you. Uh, I was curious, is Parkinson's at all discriminatory in the people that it attacks? I, I've known several people who had Parkinson's and they were absolutely brilliant. I mean, they, they, they were, were so intelligent and uh, it, it seems so unfair. Um, that's, oh gosh, that, that, that brings up so many um, memories and emotions through me. And um, yes, it, it's, it's discriminatory in many, many ways. Um, first of all, it prefers men to women. 
So more men get Parkinson's than, than women do. And in women, it can be a little different as well. Um, there, there are some people who think that women are a little more prone to side effects of the medicines. Um, in terms of intellectual capabilities, I haven't come across that, but um, I, can, I can tell you, I mean, I, I wouldn't rule out any of these um, discriminations at all. And I remember when I was training, my mentor, um, Stan Fahn, had brought up, he said, gee, have you, have you seen how many athletes we see with Parkinson's? And for a while, you know, we, we were convinced that uh, there was something about having a superior metabolism, if you like, um, that could put you at risk. Um, we also know that there, there are genetic risk factors. And so um, people who have Parkinson's in the family, on average, are a, a little bit higher risk. There are particular genes that discriminate with regard to people's um, backgrounds. Uh, when I worked in New York, um, you know, we saw a lot of uh, people in the Ashkenazi population had the GBA gene for Parkinson's, um, and they they that they they were absolutely wonderful and gave of themselves, you know, to um, uh, that really pushed the research forward. Um, there are other populations where you'll find other genes that are overrepresented for genetic forms of Parkinson's. So, yeah, it's 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 highly discriminatory. All right, thank you. And this will be the last question, um, and this is that one can find a variety of places offering stem cell therapy using. I'm not sure I can pronounce this correctly, mesenchymal stem cells yes. from the individual's fat tissue. Do you have any confidence in these treating, treatments? First of all, you, you, nailed, you nailed the pronunciation. I think everyone uh, says that a little bit differently, actually. But um, yeah, we, we struggle with this. Um, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a range of places. Um, I've had patients in my own practice who have gone to... Um, obtain this type of therapy thinking, you know, it's, it's my, it's my right to try. Why, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I try it as long as it's safe? Um, all well and good, except we don't always know that these are safe. Um, on the, you know, and on the, um, at the extreme, um, there are definitely places where you do get the impression that they're um, more out to exploit people's vulnerabilities. Um, and, and, and kind of mixing what isn't really very good science into um, a therapy that people are being asked to pay thousands of dollars for. Um, so it's, it's a really tough one. There are some really good studies on these types of stem cells. They have been studied in Parkinson's, they've been studied in uh, multiple system atrophy. So I, I think it might be one of those areas where it's very gray, um, certainly no slam dunk there. There's uh, very little proven there, but maybe in the future we can understand better how to prepare the cells, how to do the quality control, how to deliver them and, and what they actually do. And we're not there yet. Okay. Well, this has been so enlightening. We thank you, Dr. Care. Claire Hinchcliffe for being with us tonight. I want everyone to know that this will be archived on our website uh, and our YouTube channel. So you can share this with your friends uh, and with anyone you happen to know who might be challenged by this disease. So our next event will be Dr. David Lee. He is the Director of Comprehensive Prostate Cancer Program who will be presenting Diagnosing and Managing Prostate Cancer, What You Need to Know. So we hope you will join us. That will be on November 15th. And uh, we wish you a good evening. And we thank you again, Dr. Hanchcliffe. Thanks so much for having me.